So next we're going to move on to the eyes. So we're going to do our objective exam. So the first thing that we want to do is, of course, inspect. Yes. Because that's going to be our first assessment always with every body system. So key items of the anatomy to refresh. Mm -hmm. The sclera. So the sclera, that's going to be the whites of the eyes. That's important to know, especially as we move forward, because if you get confused about the sclera versus the conjunctiva mm -hmm. versus the pupils, yes. then it can be very confusing about which test you're supposed to be doing. Of course. So then the conjunctiva is going to be that mucousy part at the lower part of the lid. Mm -hmm. So I'm actually going to pull at the bottom of your lids. Can you go ahead and look up? And so that's going to be that glossy pinkish bed, mucousy bed, that we want to be pink moist and intact. The little pocket, right? Yes. Okay. And so, funny thing, the conjunctiva is actually transparent. So really what you're looking at is the vessels underneath, mm. and which is why we want it to be pink, moist, and intact. Okay. So then we have the cornea. Your cornea, I like to call it the saran wrap covering of the eye. So if you think about like saran wrap or plastic wrap that you use for if you have leftover food to keep it from spoiling. Yeah. So your cornea is basically that glossy saran wrap coating of your eye. Okay. And so just like with saran wrap, when you're putting it on your leftovers, you want it to be nice and smooth and intact with no tears, no bunching uh, to the cornea or to your saran wrap. It's like that little bubble if you look at someone from the peripheral, right? Yes, yes. And it just like bubbles out. You know, it's funny, uh, side note here, I was uh, dating my ex like six years ago. She was curling her hair with a curling iron, a flat iron, right? Mm -hmm. Or one of those wands, I don't know. She turns and burns her cornea. I don't even know how this happened, but <laughs> then she goes in an ambulance to the hospital. I'm like, why would you? Okay, anyways, but so uh, she like smells something burning and apparently it was confirmed that she actually burned her cornea with uh, a hot iron. Something. Ouch. Yeah. So there is actually, there is a test of, there's a reflex the cornea has uh -huh. to protect itself from something like that. Wait, really? Um, to actually protect it from even just something coming at your eye, oh. which we'll talk about more in a moment. It's called the corneal reflex. Oh, okay. Which you'll talk about more in a moment. Uh, so then we have the pupil. So the mm -hmm. pupil is going to be that black dot in the very center of the eye. So you have your iris, which is the colored portion, which can be blue, green, brown. Mm -hmm. uh, but then that pupil is that middle black dot. And so it's actually a muscular component. And so what that pupil does is it will change in size based on either the amount of light around it or around your patient, around the person, mm -hmm. or also the distance of an object. Even uh, medications, right, can dilate as well as constrict. Absolutely, absolutely. Yes. And so cranial nerve two, like we talked about before, so that's gonna deal with your vision, but vision only. So your ability to see up close, to see far away, to see stop signs, mm -hmm. to see speed limits, uh, to read discharge instructions, to read your nursing textbook. Oh no, don't do that. <laughs> <laughs> Also, it's peripheral vision. So if you've ever gone to go get like your driver's test and they make you look in those little bit. Uh, oh yeah, like little binocular looking things. Yes. Yeah, yeah. And they have, they tell you to look straight ahead, not to move your eyes, because it's not movement of the eyes, it's mm. only that vision, peripheral vision. Okay. And so one of the big things is that the Snellen eye chart is one of the most common and accurately used way to test vision. Mm -hmm. So the Snellen eye chart is one of the most commonly used and accurate measures of visual acuity. It has lines of letters that are decreasing in size. So the big thing here and commonly tested on, need to remember the patient always stands 20 feet away. The patient never moves. And so on the side of all of these rows of letters, mm -hmm. you have the numbers on the side that correspond to that visual score. Oh. An important thing to notice is the first number in each of these is always 20. That's because the patient always stands 20 feet away the patient never moves. I forgot about that. I was like, 2020, what does that even mean? Okay. Great question. So what is that second number? Yeah. So if 20 stands for where the patient is standing, mm -hmm. that bottom number stands for where the pool of averages or everyone else would be standing. Oh. So if a patient can read something 2020, yes. it means what you can see, or I guess you, what you <laughs> could see at 20 feet, the rest of us standing at 20 feet could see the same thing. Mm. But like, you know how pilots have really good vision yeah. and usually it's uncorrected, they don't need contacts, they don't need glasses, mm -hmm. and they'll say they have 2010 vision. Oh. So that means what that pilot can read at 20 feet, the rest of us have to stand at 10 feet to see. Oh, wow. So we have to stand closer. Makes sense. So they have better than average eyesight. I also like to think of it like a score on an exam. If you get 20 out of 10 points, 
Okay. You get bonus points. So it's like bonus eyesight. Oh, that makes sense. I was like, wait a minute, how do you, on a 10 question exam, get 20 points? Okay, that makes sense. Bonus eyesight, so extra. Uh, but then let's say if someone has 20 30 vision, mm -hmm. so that patient's at 20 feet because they never move, but then what the rest of us, we would be standing at 30 feet further away. So kind of like getting 20 out of 30 points at a, on an exam or quiz. It's not as good. Yeah. So if that larger number comes second, then that means they have less than average eyesight. Nursing school is hard work. SimpleNursing.com makes it simple. We take your classroom lectures and notes to create a handcrafted study plan with specialized videos and visual study guides that highlight only the top tested need to know key points, coupled with thousands of practice questions to test your knowledge, all neatly organized in our new app. Try it for free today. Visit SimpleNursing.com. And then we can also test near vision. So you can either use, this is a Jaeger chart, and essentially this card you would just hold 14 inches away from your face. Oh wow, okay. So you'd hold it 14 inches away from the face and have the patient read it. Uh, lots of times if you don't have one of these available, then you can also have the patient read their discharge instructions or read a newspaper print. Oh, uh, that okay. can always substitute for that. But if you ever hear about a Jaeger chart, that's what this is. You know what, I've never even, I don't think, seen a real Jaeger chart up close and personal. I always see like these three little, you know, E looking things that are like always upside down. And stuff. Right. I, was, I thought you were saying Jaegermeister chart. I was like, wait a minute, I'm not good for that. <laughs> Jaegermeister chart belongs in Club 180. <laughs> yes, that's correct. <laughs> now for a practice question. The nurse is planning to assess a client's near vision. Which technique should be used? Option A, shine a light on the bridge of the nose. No, shining a light on the bridge of the nose tests the corneal light reflex. How about option B, have the client read a newspaper print held 14 inches from the eyes. Remember, near vision is tested by asking the client to read a newspaper held 14 inches from the eyes here. So this is actually correct. And the last two options are incorrect here. So in option C, Ask the client to move the eyes in the direction of the moving finger. No, moving the eyes in the direction of a moving finger test for extraocular movements. And the last one, D, have the client stand 20 feet from a wall chart and read the letters after covering one eye. No, this is incorrect. Have the client read the letters from the wall chart for central and distant vision here. So next we're gonna talk about the confrontation test. So this test is gonna test your peripheral vision, which again is cranial nerve two. So with the confrontation test, what's special about this is both the nurse and the patient are going to cover an eye. So the nurse is gonna position themselves, you'd wanna be level with the patient about two feet away. Mm -hmm. So we're about two feet away. So now go ahead and I gave you a card. Can you please cover your eye on this side? Very good. So now go ahead and look straight towards my way and don't move your eyes. Tell me when you see the tip of my finger. So I'm gonna move it in, say now. No. Very good, so, okay, so uh, you would basically ha slowly move your finger towards the midline, and when the patient can see it peripherally, then that would indicate where their peripheral vision is. Okay. And so with the confrontation test specifically, the nurse also covers their eye because the nurse is using themselves as the control of when should the patient be able to see it. However, it does assume that the nurse has good peripheral vision. <laughs> so also one thing is you're not really sure if the patient's telling you the truth. Yeah, that's fair. But it is commonly in textbooks, commonly asked about on exams. One that I've seen in practice uh, used more often mm -hmm. and said, go ahead and keep looking straight ahead at me and tell me how many fingers I'm holding up. Two, one, three, five. Very good. And so with that, I don't have to have good peripheral vision. I just need to know what, how many fingers I'm holding up myself. And also you can confirm that the patient's telling the truth. Oh, that makes sense. Okay. So I see that one commonly used and practiced more. However, the other one is oftentimes tested on nursing school exams. Now let's talk about a key term called fixation. This is basically the ability of the eye to be fixated on an object and kind of like tracking it. So go ahead and watch this with just your eyes. Don't move your head. So the ability to look at an object and follow it. These are extraocular movements of cranial three, four, and six, so the cranial nerves, three, four, and six. This is basically muscle movement of the eye because if you didn't know, the eye 
has a lot of muscles that help it move side to side, up and down, and really all around. Now, a lot of people when testing crayon are three, four, and six, sometimes they'll draw an H and have the patient follow. Mm -hmm. I prefer cat whiskers. Oh, okay. The reason why I prefer drawing cat whiskers, so go ahead and follow my pen with just your eyes, going up the center, then to the side, back to center, down. So again, I'm drawing three cat whiskers on one side, now I'm gonna draw three on the other. So, and if you think about my cat whiskers that I drew, so there are three cat whiskers on one side, three on the other, Ooh, okay. so six all together. <laughs> so then you can remember three, six, and four is the other number. Oh man. That's so it helps you remember not only the test that you're doing, for those six cardinal fields of gaze, because you want to make sure those eyes move in all six directions. Okay. And so those six cardinal fields of gaze, those extraocular motors, at, or movements as you said, mm -hmm. and so being able to move in all those directions, and we want it to be smooth, coordinated movement. We don't want there to be nystagmus, which is where they have this involuntary fluttering of the eye, oh, yeah. or any strabismus, mm -hmm. which would be if one eye had weakness, or it could be one or both. Mm -hmm. uh, so oftentimes it's called like a lazy eye. Yeah, like a wandering, yeah. Yes, and so we don't, don't want any nystagmus, which again is that fluttering, involuntary fluttering or dancing of the eye or the pupil, uh, and then no strabismus either. Mm -hmm. So again, for the crayoners three, four, and six, we do the cat whiskers and we want smooth, coordinated movement. Now for a Saunders question here. The nurse is testing EOMs, extraocular movements or muscles here, in a client to assess for muscle weakness. The nurse should implement which assessment technique to do this? So option A, test the corneal reflexes. No, this is the cotton wisp test for cranial nerve five and seven. How about option B, test the six cardinal positions of gaze. Yes, this is correct. The cat whisker test is used to assess for muscle weakness. Remember, it's moving in all directions. So think muscle weakness or even muscle movement. We're just testing for that. It should be smooth and coordinated. Now the last two options are incorrect because testing the visual acuity using a Snellen eye chart is to assess cranial nerve number two. And the last option, test sensory function by asking the client to close their eyes and then lightly touch the forehead, cheek, and chin is incorrect. This is supposed to test sensory function cranial nerve number five. So earlier when I was talking about those six cardinal fields of gaze yes. in cranial nerves three, four, and six, I said we didn't want any nystagmus or strabismus, mm -hmm. which again, nystagmus is the fluttering, and strabismus is that weakness of the eye muscles around the eye. And so one way that we test for that is by the cover test, or sometimes we will call it the cover uncover test. Okay. So kind of like the peekaboo test. So if we had concern that this patient had some weakness around an eye, we would have him cover that eye with a card. Let's go ahead and cover it up. So if we thought this eye was weak, you cover up the weak eye, and then you have the patient remove the cover. Go ahead and remove it. All right, so nothing happened. So that means the patient does not have strabismus. So what would I see if he did? Okay. Well, if the patient does have weak extraocular muscles, when that eye is covered, that weak eye, since it has nothing to focus on, will go do 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 and look around. <laughs> so when you pull the card away, it jumps back to center. I didn't see that, so you do not have strabismus. That's good to hear, okay. So if you cover the eye, then the little eye will go out and play and yes. just get lazy. Yes, and then it when strays you... around, strabismus. Oh, the strabismus stray, yes, yes I remember this. Yes, the straying this. of the eye. Of and so one thing is uh, oftentimes, especially if this is caught early in kids, mm -hmm. usually what they'll do is they'll put an eye patch on the good eye, mm -hmm. the strong eye, because it'll kind of whip that lazy eye or the weak eye into shape. Oh yeah, okay, so it'll strengthen the muscles like going to the gym. Yes, okay. exactly. And make it forced to focus on things. And then oftentimes if that doesn't work, then they'll do surgery to try to you know pull those muscles and whatnot. That makes sense. Okay, so now moving on to Perla. This is pupillary light reflex. So remember, pupillary light reflex is we're just shining a light into the pupils to see if they constrict when light shines on the retina there. So we typically conduct this in a dark room and ask the person to gaze into the distance and this dilates the pupils when we advance that light from side to side. We're really looking for a response where we see that pupil constriction. So normally we see constriction, right? And how is that supposed to look? So when we're doing the pupils with Perla, you wanna test one at a time. Okay. So go ahead and look straight ahead. So typically we would darken the room and I would shine a light and keep your eyes open looking straight ahead. 
I'm going to shine a light on this pupil. So this pupil is getting the direct light. So it's going to constrict. Right. However, this one should also constrict. Both of them. Yes. Okay. At the same time, we call that being consensual. Mm -hmm. So if they constrict consensually, it has to do with what's going on up here at the optic chasm and whatnot. But essentially, even though this one only sees the light, this one should constrict consensually uh -huh. if they're communicating as they should up in the brain and everything's working correctly. So sometimes you'll see people just go back and forth like this, right. which doesn't test consensuality as much. Mm -hmm. Kind of think like in the real world when um, two people agree to have intercourse. It's mm -hmm. consensual intercourse. Right, of course. So basically when the two pupils are agreeing to do the same thing, mm -hmm. it's also consensual. Yeah, I've, I've even seen some nurses block off the eye and go like this. Absolutely. Yes. It's to ensure they're testing one and then the other. Okay. So with Perla, with the pupils being equal, round, reactive to light, with those first components leaving accommodation off for just a moment. So with that first component, we're looking at the pupils and lots of times a lot of these pin lights will have a gauge on the side where you can compare to note that size in millimeters. So you just want to look at the pupils and note their size. Are they equal in size and round? Mm -hmm. And so then you would have the patient keep looking straight ahead and you want to shine the light on one eye and it should constrict. Mm -hmm. And then you'd shine it on the other eye mm -hmm. or the other pupil to be specific. Yeah. And it should also constrict. And we want them to constrict consensually like we talked about before. Nice. So shining in opposite eyes should constrict together. Yes. And with that, the cranial nerve that's responsible for seeing the light is cranial nerve 2 because it's vision oh, and yeah. that sensory component. Okay. Fun fact though, uh -oh. although cranial nerves, uh oh, although cranial nerves 3, 4, and 6, they're buddies, right? Yes, they all move together. Okay. They work together. There's a special party trick that cranial nerve 3 can do that oh. buddies 4 and 6 can't do. Okay. And that's the pupil constriction to light. Oh. So cranial nerve 2 sees the light. Wow. And cranial nerve three is the one responsible for moving the pupil in response. Oh, so it like brings it together. I love that visual. Okay, yes. yeah. Think cranial nerve number three is we are moving it together like this. So it's constricting the little pupils. That was really cool. I didn't even think about that. Now for a practice question. A light is pointed at the client's pupil, which then constricts. It is also noted that the other pupil contracts or constricts as well. Though it is not exposed to the bright light, which term describes this later phenomenon? Consensual reaction. Remember, shining a light into one pupil is supposed to constrict both pupils. Okay, so now for the last part of Perla, the A. So the A stands for accommodation. Okay. So essentially the pupils, not only do they respond to light with mm -hmm. that pupillary light reflex, which is cranial nerves two and three working together, but they also accommodate based on the distance of an object. So, when an object is far away, so go ahead and keep looking at this object. When it's far away, the pupils are going to be dilated or bigger and they're going to be midline. The closer the object gets, they're going to constrict and converge, which is a fancy way of meaning get smaller and go cross. So as they come in, they constrict and converge based on the distance of the object. A little side note, okay. uh, I saw my pediatrician till well after you were supposed to until I was in my later 20s. Really? And whenever he did accommodation, he would always go like this, follow my finger, boop. <laughs> so for the longest time, I call it the boop test. Okay. <laughs> and even still in nursing school, it took me a while to stop going boop for accommodation. And so that is when your pupils will constrict and converge based on the distance of an object. So once again, how do we record normal Perla? So remember, P is for pupils that are E, equal, R is round, reactive light is the second R, and accommodation. Now, it's funny because in nursing school, we would always just be like, oh yeah, Perla, or Perla, or, and everyone's like, what is accommodation? And so I never really understood that going throughout nursing school until I started practicing. Boop test. The boop test. <laughs> now for a few questions here. The nurse documents Perla following an assessment of a client's eyes. Which finding supports this statement? Constriction of pupil when object brought close to the eye. Yes, the correct term there is the constriction of the pupil there. Now, question number two. The nurse is preparing to test a client's eyes for accommodation. The nurse would have the client focus on an object in which sequence for this test? Starting far and then going near. So remember the boop test. 
So booping on the nose. When testing accommodation, the nurse asks the client to focus on a distant object, let's just say a finger or even a pencil, and remain focused on the object until, let's say, it goes onto the client's nose and moves closer to the eyes. Okay, so we talked about the pupil. Mm -hmm. Remember, that's that black dot, that's basically a muscle. So now we're gonna move on to the cornea. If you remember before we talked about, it's important to know the difference between, between the two. So the cornea is that smooth, glossy saran wrap covering, like that plastic wrap. So we have two different corneal tests, and they're very easily confused, especially on exams. Okay. So important to note. One is called the corneal reflex, and the other one is called the corneal light reflex. Oh man, okay, there's a, is there a heavy reflex or just a light? No. Just a light. <laughs> well, so, but that's a great way to know. What's the difference between the two? Mm -hmm. If it says the word light in it, oh, you okay. use a pin light. Yeah. If it doesn't, you're gonna use a cotton wisp. Okay. So let's talk about the two. So first is the corneal light reflex. That's also called the Hirschberg test. And so essentially for this one, and it's different than Perla, remember Perla, we did one eye and then the other. This one, we just shine a light at both corneas or both eyes. All we want is that light to reflect symmetrically off of both corneas. So we just want it be, to be in the same spot. Mm -hmm. And if it weren't, if there was a tear in the cornea, then it might be like refracted or it wouldn't be as symmetric. So we don't care where it's shining, one o'clock, two o'clock, three o'clock, right in the middle, <laughs> just as long as it's in the same spot on both corneas. So you just, like I did, direct the patient to uh, steer straight ahead. Mm -hmm. And all you do is hold the light in the middle and you want it to shine off the same spot on both corneas. So if it doesn't shine off the same spot on both corneas, then something's wrong. We're worried about some type of corneal tear, abrasion, okay. which can be really, really painful. Anyone who's ever had a corneal abrasion, I had someone tell me that it feels like being punched in the eye over and over really? again. Uh, so that's what we're looking. We want it to be nice, smooth, glossy, and intact. Or burned with a curling iron. Yes. <laughs> or, you know what's, okay, now I still think about this. I, we had a unit secretary in the ER mm -hmm. that I think got papers thrown at them or something. It was just a joke and they got a paper cut on their cornea. And, oh man, I can't even think about that. <laughs> oh my gosh, so painful. Yes. Which, so if you were to shine a light, mm -hmm. you would see a cut or a tear kind of through, or a little, sometimes it looks like a little hairpin line. Mm -hmm. uh, lots of times if you go into like an ophthalmist office or whatnot, or you go to see someone about that, they'll mm -hmm. drop some dye in so they can see where that tear is. But again, very painful. Oh wow. So then the next one is just called the corneal reflex. So no I light. say, if it doesn't have the word light in yeah. it, do not pick an answer in the exam that has the word pen light in it. So just the corneal reflex. Mm -hmm. So the corneal reflex, I like to call the cotton wisp test. So essentially the corneal reflex is testing your cornea's ability to protect itself. If papers come flying at it, yeah. or a curling iron, or if someone throws a bunch of sand at your face, that your eye should blink to protect itself. And so that's what we're hoping happens. So to test this in our patient, I'm not gonna throw a bunch of papers at his eye because okay. we know that can cause some damage yes. or sand or whatnot. So instead I'm gonna use a cotton wisp just in case it's not intact, then I don't cause any real damage. Okay. So go ahead and look straight ahead and blink whenever you feel necessary. Good. So he didn't let me touch his cornea with a cotton wisp, uh, but his sensation and urge to blink that occurred means that his corneal reflex is intact. So it's basically a protection mechanism as the closer you get. Uh, does it have to touch the eyelashes at all? Nope. It's oh, just okay. so, and essentially there are two cranial nerves that work together. Okay. Cranial nerve five, the trigeminal, which is the forehead, cheek, and jaw, senses it's coming and then cranial nerve seven, which does all your facial movements, like smile, frown, puff out your cheeks. Mm -hmm. Also open your eyes really wide and close them shut really tight. So it's the sensory component of five and the motor component of seven that caused the blink. Oh. So cranial nerve five senses it's coming and seven blinks in response. 